Good to see all y'all. Good to see our online audience as well. Always glad you check in with us too. And I uh, uh, just wanted to let a few things we need to let you know. Uh, the first thing is this. It's a brand new month. It's July, if you can believe that. Uh, so there's a brand new newsletter. So make sure you get one there back there uh, on the, what are we calling it? The Welcome Center, I think. The, the guys from the guys from Lincoln Valley called it the Welcome Center. I like that. So that's better than the table. The, the literature table. So anyway, so get you a, get you a newsletter and you'll see some things in there. One of the things that you'll that you'll see in the newsletter, and we want to remind you of, is that uh, we are on our summer break for our Wednesday and Thursday events. So our Wednesday night uh, Bible study and prayer meeting and our Common Ground. That's correct. Isn't happening until August seventh and eighth. And eighth. Yeah. That's so, however, that said. Uh, you'll also read in the newsletter that some folks want uh, uh, wanted to uh, get together and have an informal um, uh, meeting on Wednesday, and so that is going to happen yeah. uh, this Wednesday. Just to pray uh, together and spend some time so together. If you, so you want to know about that um, when that's going to happen, if it's going to happen, make sure you talk to Leslie yeah. because she is hand up. handling that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it is, but it will happen this Wednesday. Seven. 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 Okay. What else is happening? Uh, oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Hey, no, not that oh, yeah. So, so you all know that uh, our friends, 22 of them from, from Midland Valley, South Carolina, came in and uh, did all this work and did work in the community as well. Well, while they were here, uh, we just made a comment. Boy, it sure would be nice to uh, replace this carpet to kind of match everything else. And so this week, uh, we got a message from Midland Valley that they sent us, they raised and sent us $1,000 uh, to, uh, to yeah. help with uh, amazing. Uh, the carpet. And that's not quite probably going to cover it, so there may be a little bit more than that. If you'd like to help with that, um, on your envelope, just write carpet on the outside of it. And you, and and we'll put it the donation will go for it. Yeah. Yeah. One of the joys of being the pastors of this church yes. is when we get to take in new members. Exactly and right. we do that often, and uh, we're going to do that this morning. morning. Yeah. Yeah. So, Andrea, please. Dearly beloved, the privileges and blessings that we have in association together in the Church of Jesus Christ are very sacred and precious. Don't you start. <laughs> <laughs> there is in it such hallowed fellowship as cannot otherwise be known. There is such helpfulness and counsel as can be found only in the Church. There is the godly care of pastors with the teachings of the word and the helpful inspiration of corporate worship. And there is cooperation in service, accomplishing that which can, cannot otherwise be done. And the doctrines that the church rests on as essential to Christian experience are, are brief and simple. We believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We especially emphasize the deity of Jesus Christ and the personality of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the atonement through Jesus is for the whole human race, and that whosoever repents and believes on the Lord Jesus is justified and regenerated and saved from sin, and that the Holy Spirit enables us to live holy and righteous lives. We believe in the resurrection, the coming kingdom of God, and the judgment. Do you heartily believe these truths, and do you acknowledge 
Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And do you realize that he saves you now? If so, answer I do. I do. Okay. Desiring to unite with this church, Andrea, do you promise to give yourself to the fellowship and work of God in connection with it? Will you endeavor in every way to glorify God by a humble walk, godly conversation, and holy service by devotedly giving of your means, <sighs> by faithful attendance <coughs> upon the means of grace? And will you seek earnestly to perfect holiness of heart and life? If so, answer, I will. I will. On behalf of the largest church of the Nazarene, we are so glad to welcome you into our membership with its fellowship, its responsibilities, its privileges. May God bless and keep you and enable you to be faithful in all good works and that your life and witness may be effective in the advancement of his kingdom. Now, church. We have a question for you all, as always. Will you welcome Andrea into our church family, and will you love her and be a source of encouragement and strength to her, and in turn allow her to be a source of blessing and help to us? See if so, everybody say we will. We will. Amen. 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 Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yay. Thank you. the tradition when we welcome a new member into the church we sing this song so let's sing together as the body of Christ I'm so glad cathedrals or saintly persons. O oh God, whose holiness is often discovered in simple, everyday places and simple, everyday people, plant your holiness in this place right now, in us right now. Grow us this hour that we might flower right where we are with the beauty of your holiness. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.
Jesus, be the same. 
our prayer this morning is that Jesus would be the center of everything we do, every ministry, every conversation, every everything that we do, that Jesus is the center. In the midst of darkness and chaos, God imagined. In the fury and the darkness, God imagined a world filled with trees and blue skies and fluffy white clouds. In the meadow, God stood and imagined foxes and bluebirds and slithering snakes. In a world of rainstorms and wildlife and cattle and grasses <coughs> blowing in the breeze, God imagined humanity. In a world teeming with billions of people, God imagined you. God imagined you, and God imagined me. We are created in the image of God. God imagined us, and God loves each and every one of us. Let's continue to worship our God, family of believers, communion of saints, beloved.
we are going to begin today with a little quiz, a little question for you. We're going to play, uh, what's the connection? What's the connection between the following works of art? What do they have in common? Now, please hold your answers. Don't shout them out until you've seen all of the items in question. The first, uh, the first item that we're looking for the connection uh, between is Aesop's Fables. Now, the works uh, by A. A. Milne and Beatrix Potter and Kenneth Graham and Jack London and James Harriet and George Orwell and T.S. Eliot and Andrew Lloyd Webber and the cartoons of Walt Disney, the Warner Brothers, and Hanna-Barbera. Now, what's the connection? Animal. See, see, I knew that was too easy. You probably already guessed way, way back then. The answer is animals. And those are just a few instances, mostly quite modern, of the place of animals in human art and culture. The truth is that we could be here all day naming examples of the way that for thousands of years of human history, we have looked to the animal kingdom for entertainment, and education and inspiration. You know, since our earliest origins, people have regarded our fellow human, our fellow non-human living creatures and painted pictures of them and <laughs> sung songs about them and told stories about them. And so it's not surprising at all when we look at the vast and varied books of the Bible. From the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, to the story of Noah's Ark, to the plagues in Egypt, to the details of clean and unclean animals in Leviticus, to the illustrations in Proverbs and the, lit the wisdom literature, to the parables in the New Testament and the imagery in the book of Revelation, we find birds and bugs and fish and frogs and serpents and dragons and sheep and camels and lambs and lions and locusts and livestock and on and on and on. You know, sometimes animals are important, even essential characters in a story that's being told in the Bible. Sometimes they're just peripheral details. Sometimes they're used metaphorically. Sometimes they're used as a good example whose behavior we ought to emulate. Sometimes they're bad examples. They represent attitudes and actions we ought to avoid. But one thing is certain. If you open your Bible up to any page, you won't have to read very far before finding some mention of one critter or another, whether natural or supernatural. And so over the next six weeks, from today through the 11th of August, we're going to be considering several passages of Scripture in which animals in one way or another, specifically or generally, appear. And as we do, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to speak to us in some very enlightening and edifying ways if we'll be open to it. And I'm looking forward to digging into the Word with you all, and I hope you are too. And as I have sort of studied and meditated and prayed about this series and given careful consideration about where to begin, what text we ought to look at first, what scripture would be the ideal sort of jumping off place. After much thought, I arrived at a very obvious conclusion, and that is this. We ought to begin at the beginning. And so that's where we're going to be today, at the beginning. Not just the beginning of the Bible, but the beginning of everything. The world and the universe and everything in it, including us. Because we're going to be considering the creation narrative in the first few chapters of Genesis today. <clears throat> and it's in those first few chapters. In chapter 3, to be specific, that we find the very first mention of an individual animal in the Bible. One specific creature. In, in chapters 1 and 2, we find the details of God's creating all the animals in general. The birds of the air and the fish in the sea and the cattle and the wild animals in general as whole groups. But in chapter 3, one specific animal comes 
to the forefront of the narrative and not simply as a character on the sidelines of the action but as a character with an essential and even crucial role to play in the way the plot of the story develops you take this animal out of the story and that changes everything and that animal is the serpent <clears throat> and not only is the serpent the first individual to be mentioned in the biblical narrative, the first individual animal. But the serpent is also the first animal to speak in the biblical narrative. In chapters 1 and 2, God has spoken. He speaks creation into existence in chapter 1. And, and Hadam, the, the human, or Adam, has spoken in chapter 2. But in chapter 3, the serpent speaks. And as we're going to see, that's pretty much all the serpent does. Just talks. There's really no other action or behavior attributed to the serpent. Just words. But as we'll also see, words are enough. More than enough to have devastating effects and monumental outcomes. But you may be thinking, and it would be not surprising if you were, you may be thinking, a talking snake, seriously, now, of course, in time, this serpent will come to be identified in Christian tradition as the embodiment of evil, as Satan himself. But there's not really any indication of that yet in the original text. What we see there is simply a talking snake. And so in, in our contemporary viewpoint, a contemporary reader might well raise their eyebrows in disbelief and wonder just how literally we, they, they ought to take this fantastic tale. And I guess my response would be that's really up to you and the Holy Spirit. And there are certainly things in the Holy Scriptures that ought to be taken literally and other things that are, are more symbolic and metaphorical. But I will tell you this. I have heard plenty of folks argue long and loud that the talking snake and the six-day creation narrative ought to be taken literally as historical fact, as the simple truth. But then they turn over to the New Testament and read Jesus' direct commands to love your enemies and feed the hungry and give to the poor and turn the other cheek. And then suddenly things get all nuanced and metaphorical and complex, you see. And that is just about as backward and fundamentally flawed an interpretive strategy as you're ever likely to hear. Amen. And so, with that hermeneutical caveat, let's think for a little while about Genesis chapter 3, where we find the familiar story of what happens in the Garden of Eden after the creation. Now, you may have noticed, if you looked at the first few chapters of Genesis, that the story of creation is told in chapter 1. That's when God speaks and through His Word creates the universe and all that's in it. And then it seems that the story is retold a little differently. And that's because that's exactly what happens. Because the story repeats. And God is described as more physically involved in creation in chapters 2 and 3. He's not simply speaking, but doing and making. Getting his hands dirty. And the most likely explanation for these two stories is that what we find in chapter 1 was probably written around 500 years after what's in chapters 2 and 3. And what's in chapters 2 and 3 was probably first written down around 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years. That's a long time. And when you consider that this story had been told through the oral tradition before it was ever written down, that people had been telling it to each other and to their children for what, what could have been hundreds or even thousands of years before that. Well, then you begin to realize what an ancient origin story we are hearing when we read the words in the first few chapters of Genesis. You know, there are ancient origin stories in a lot of cultures, stories about where people came from and how the world and the universe works. And a, a lot of them are weird and fantastic. They involve monsters and demons and all sorts of <laughs> gods and primeval animals. And, and, and origin stories don't just answer the question, where did we and everything come from? But they also, when they work well, they answer questions like, what are we like? 
what ought our relationship to the world, to what's been created, and to other people, and to the divine, what ought that to be like? And when you think about the fact that when we read the creation stories in Genesis, we are reading origin stories that are thousands and thousands of years old from a culture very different from ours, then it is a miracle that we can understand them at all. That we would have anything in common with those who told this story so long ago. But when you consider the fact that it's, that not only is this story understandable, but it's relatable and applicable to ourselves and to our lives in the 21st century. When you consider that we can see ourselves in this story and that it is as fresh and relevant as today's news, then that is truly mind boggling is to me and it's a testament to the power and the inspiration and meaning of the scriptures and to the power of the spirit through which we approach them that's right now let's look at the situation before we get to genesis chapter three a little background so we put things in context now we've been told in chapter two that god has created hadam a human being Hadam from the Hadama. See, there's a little pun there. That's the soil or the clay. And literally, that's red clay like we had back in Georgia, South Georgia. And, uh, and God has breathed the breath of life into the human. We talked about that last week when we looked at Psalm 150. And God has put the human in the middle of a garden filled with all sorts of trees for food as well as a tree called the tree of life and a tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're told that God put the human into the garden to till it and to keep it, to protect it and to preserve it. And God said it's permissible to eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, God has also split this human into two parts, male and female, Ish and Ishah in the Hebrew. Adam and Eve, and that's why a man and woman become one flesh in marriage, because they were one flesh to begin with. And finally, we're told that they were naked, but they were not ashamed. Now, what I want you to notice is the intimate, cooperative relationships that have been formed in the creation. These humans have a relationship with, to God who provides all that they need, including a vocation, a purpose, and that's to care for creation and all that's in it. And that includes each other. And these humans are also related to one another because they are the very same flesh. And they're related to creation as deeply as they could possibly be because it is, the earth is, the very <laughs> stuff they are made of. And their calling, that vocation to care and protect and respect creation includes only one prohibition. And that is, they are not to eat the fruit of one particular tree. So this is essentially the law in the Garden of Eden. The law at this point. Do take care of creation and don't eat from that tree. Eventually there will be ten rules in the law. And then in time there will be hundreds more as the religious authorities complicate things. But at this point... The law is quite simple and clear. So these humans, Adam and Eve, have been provided with a sustaining and edifying environment and companionship and a job to do. They've been provided by God with all that they need to be fully human to, to fulfill their calling. The whole of creation, all of the universe, exemplifies that harmony, that shalom that God has built into every thing. This is a peaceable kingdom, you might say. The world is a place of orientation, using the language we talked about during the psalm series. All is well at the end of chapter 2. Uh, chapter 3 is coming. Let's read together our scripture for this morning. Verses 1 through 13. They're in your sermon notes. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The 
the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You shall not touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and he said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. Now if you were listening closely, you might have noticed that the serpent really doesn't do an awful lot in these verses. In fact, to be perfectly honest, the serpent really doesn't do anything in the strictest sense. There are no actions taken by the serpent. He doesn't move around or go anywhere or accomplish some task. He does nothing but speak. Two times in verse 1 and then in verses 4 and 5. He asks one question and makes one statement. And as we look at these verses, we find that all the servant does is talk. He's all talk and no action. But what strikes me as interesting is that the servant's words in chapter 3 offer a kind of contrast to the words spoken by God in chapter 1. When God speaks all things into existence. When God creates with his words. And I think it could be said. That the serpent too is a kind of creator with his words. But the serpent doesn't create new things out of the formless void. Rather the serpent's words create some conditions. Some ways of being. And the most important point I want you to take away from these verses. Is the fact that even though the serpent is a creature. Even though he is part of creation, even though he is not the creator, the serpent is still a creator. And his words create conditions. His words cause certain effects. His words lead to certain consequences. The serpent's words here in these verses totally change the situation. And the serpent is not the only creation whose words can create conditions and change situations. The same is true for every one of us, both positively and negatively. Words can transform, for better or for worse. Words can hurt or heal. Words can break down or build up. Words can create conditions and foster attitudes that lead to actions that are detrimental as well as those that are desirable. So for a few minutes this morning, I'd like us to think about some of the conditions that are created by the serpent's words in these verses. Because just as God's words have created the ordered cosmos from the disordered chaos in the beginning, in chapter 1, in chapter 3, we find that the serpent's words create chaos in the midst of the cosmos. So I want to suggest three things that the serpent's words create in this scenario in chapter 3 of Genesis. And the first is this. The serpent's words create confusion from clarity. We're told that the serpent is more crafty than any other animal. And the Hebrew word that's used, that's translated as crafty there, it, it sometimes has a positive connotation. It can mean clever or cunning or shrewd. And it does mean those things here, but it takes on a negative connotation. It describes someone or something who is up to no good. And so the writer in the very first sentence of this chapter lets us know that we better keep our eyes on this serpent. We better keep up our guard because he is not the most trustworthy creature in the garden. And that's ironic. Or maybe it's fitting 
because sometimes this crafty serpent is called the first theologian. The first theologian. The serpent is called the first theologian because he is the first character in the biblical narrative to think about and to talk about and to ask questions about God. That's what theologians do. You might not have considered that before, but it's true. And this theologian, this serpent, has a question for Eve. Now notice the craftiness of the serpent. He doesn't ask, did God tell you not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? No, he asked, did God say you should not treat, eat from any tree in the garden? And even before she answers, Eve must be thinking, well, no. God told us to eat from all the trees except that one. Now, why would that one be different? Maybe this isn't a necessary rule to follow. And she begins to question and evaluate, apply her own standards of right and wrong. And she's heading in the direction of determining for herself what's good and what's evil, even before she eats from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, remember we said that the law in the garden was simple and clear. Do take care of creation and don't eat from that tree. One rule made up of two parts. Now, eventually, there'll be ten rules in the law, and then in time, in time there's going to be hundreds more as the religious authorities complicate things. As other theologians use their words to bring ambiguity from simplicity and confusion from clarity. And if we fast forward to the New Testament, we find Jesus calling out those religious leaders and experts in the law, the theologians, for making things overly complicated and confusing and impossible to understand and suggesting, Jesus says, there's only one two-part commandment that you need to follow in order to follow the whole of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus' words bring clarity from confusion. But back in the garden, the serpent's words bring confusion from clarity. But Eve is shocked. This woman. She tells the serpent that God said, don't eat from that tree. Don't even touch it or you'll die. And the serpent responds, you'll not die. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now notice here that the serpent isn't lying. He has not uttered an untruth. He's technically right about what he says. Adam and Eve are not going to suddenly drop dead when they eat of that fruit. And he's right about the fact that they will be like God. Because if we look down at verse 22 in chapter 3, we find that God says, see, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now he might reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and live forever. The serpent has not lied to Eve. You know, we don't necessarily have to lie to do some damage with words, to create a harmful environment, to lead somebody down the path of destruction. See, the serpent knows that the desire to be like God is a temptation almost too great to resist. And so the serpent's words create temptation where there was trust. That's our second creation. The serpent's words create temptation from trust. Now, before the serpent spoke, these humans had no reason to question what God had told them to do. He had created everything and them. Why should they doubt that God had anything but their best interest at heart? God wouldn't withhold anything good from his children. But once the serpent speaks, that doubt that temptation begins to take hold. And it's not just a temptation to be like God that attracts Eve. She isn't just considering equality with God a thing to be grasped, to use the language of Paul in Philippians 2. We read in verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took hold of its fruit. It wasn't just that she desired equality with God to have her eyes open to what's good and evil, but first she saw that fruit was good for food. 
that it was a delight to the eyes. It was pleasing. It aroused her appetite. It looked like it would give her pleasure to consume. And it would. And it was fun to look at. Sounds an awful lot like a lot of things that still arouse us and tempt us in the 21st century, doesn't it? I think sometimes we may tend to forget that many of the things that God tells us to stay away from are pleasurable. They look and feel good. That's why they're addicted. I think sometimes the church forgets how much fun sin can be when we present the gospel to folks. The epistle to the Hebrews reminds us that there is pleasure in sin for a season. And hedonism, let's be honest about this. The pursuit of pleasure for pleasure's sake, living just to feed the appetites of the flesh is fun and exciting and pleasurable. And so is consuming what's forbidden. That's why people have affairs and eat too much and abuse substances. It feels good for a while because it isn't satisfying. And in time, there will be a cost to be paid. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Romans 8 when he said, if you live according to the flesh, you will die because the wages of sin is death. But the serpent doesn't divulge that there might be a price to be paid for eating that fruit. He doesn't read them the terms and conditions, the fine print. And Eve doesn't concern herself with the cost. And neither does Adam when Eve shares it with him. And he's been right there all along, the whole time, and he didn't raise a single objection. You know, that reminds me of all the times I've been doing something on my, on my iPhone, you know? Like downloading an app or upgrading the software, making some purchase, and that little box comes up. You know the one? It says, I have read and accept the terms and conditions. You ever read the terms and conditions? <laughs> T's and C's? Yeah, if you're anything like me, probably not. You just stroll down that little box and check it. That's how Apple gets you. Apple. This fruit. That can't be a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> my dad. My dad used to say about the Garden of Eden. He said, uh, he said, you know, the problem in the Garden of Eden wasn't an apple on the tree. It was the pear on the ground. <laughs> and ultimately, that pear. Adam and Eve, they bear responsibility for listening to the words of the serpent and allowing them to affect their actions. But it's only because the serpent spoke these words that they were able to listen to them. And so the final creation that the serpent's words generate is this. The serpent's words create scarcity from abundance. What both Adam and Eve are saying through their actions, what the serpent has convinced them of is this. What God designed and provided for us is not enough. We would prefer something else. Something that looks pretty, tastes delicious, and offers us the possibility of rising above our current status. So we're going to be led by our desires and our appetite, by our flesh, rather than by the word that God has spoken to us. In other words, this abundance that God has given us even though it includes everything except the fruit of that tree, isn't satisfactory. We want more. We want something else. We want the one thing we shouldn't have. They had everything they needed. But when they looked at it, they only saw what they lacked because the serpent's words have created scarcity from abundance. So now what? Well, now Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden where they might have eaten from the tree of life and lived forever, but now they can't. The wages of sin is death, remember. But all is not lost. The paradise has been. Because the narrative of the Bible from here on out includes time after time God's extending his provision to his people. The descendants of Adam and Eve through covenants and promises and the law and the prophet. We read again and again of God's redemptive movement toward reconciling the broken relationships that his people find themselves in. With creation and with others and with God. But time and time again, we hear the echo of the words of the serpents. We find God's provision being met with the same kind of critique that we saw in the garden. God's provision is not enough or it's not desirable. So the people fall back into their sin again and 
again and again until finally the ultimate provision is made by God when he provides his own son. The one who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. The one who hangs on a tree like fruit and says that his own body is food to be eaten. Not to bring condemnation and guilt, but to bring forgiveness and wholeness. It's Jesus who tells us in the Sermon on the Mount not to worry that we won't have enough in that food or clothing or anything else because our Heavenly Father knows what we need and provides it. He won't withhold any good thing from His children. How different are the words of the, of the Savior from the words of the servant? This morning, we can find ourselves in one of two worlds, one of two situations, and everything depends on whether we believe the words of the Savior or the words of the serpent. We can find ourselves in a place of confusion or a place of clarity, in a place of temptation or a place of trust, in a place of scarcity or a place of abundance. Words can transform our circumstances. Words can create our world. As we come to the table for communion, this morning we hear the words of Jesus and we eat together, not the forbidden fruit, but the body and blood of our Lord. And when we do, we testify that it's His Word that creates our reality. Pastor Joshua, would you come with me? This communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is a sacrament. A sacrament that proclaims his life, his sufferings, his sacrificial death, his resurrection, and the hope of coming again. We, we take this, we do this together to remember to participate, to take part in Christ's death until his return. We come to the table so that we can be renewed in life and in salvation and be made one by the Spirit. The supper is a means of grace by which Christ is present by the Spirit. And as we gather at this table, we are reminded that this is the table of Jesus Christ, a banquet prepared for everyone. All who seek to be nourished and sustained in the journey of faith, all who seek wholeness and compassionate paths to peace and justice are welcome here. This table is where we gather as the grieving, the joyful, the sinner, and the sinned against. We are the outcasts, the oddballs, the long-haired, tattooed, and pierced right alongside the straight-laced. We are the broken and wonderfully beloved. It's a place of welcome and grace and love poured out in abundance, an endless table because it belongs to God, whose love and grace have absolutely no limits. And so in unity, as the communion of saints, we confess our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Let's pray. <coughs> Blessed are you, breath of peace giver of all life, source of abundant love that knows no boundaries. We gather at your table in the name of your son, Jesus, who by your spirit was anointed to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Christ healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners, and established a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. 
we live in the hope of his coming again. Loving God, we come to your table. We remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. May this bread and wine be for us a means of grace, drawing us closer to you and to one another. And as we gather as the body of Christ to offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these, your gifts. Make them by the power of your Spirit to be for us the body and blood of Christ, <laughs> that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in the ministry of Christ to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Pastor Steve, As we distribute the elements, we would ask that you hold them prayerfully so that we can all partake together. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body, which has been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, broken for you, preserve you blameless into everlasting life. Take this and eat it. And remember that Christ died for you and be thankful. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said drink from it all of you this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins do this in remembrance of me the blood of our lord and savior jesus christ shed for you preserve you blameless into everlasting life take this and drink it and be thankful Worship team.
you, beloved, are the hands and feet of God. In Lark, Skill Morley, West Kilbride, you are called to soothe the suffering, to live with compassion, to build up God's loving peace. So as you leave this place and go out into your community, use the gifts that you have been given to build up the body of Christ and carry the love of Jesus to the world around you. Go in love, go in peace, go with God. Amen. Thank you all for worshiping with us this morning. Please be sure to take some things out of the hospitality fridge. Um, all sorts of things back there. We love you guys. Y'all have a great week. I see you next time.